Hi guys! Happy True Crime Tuesday, and welcome to episode 10 of Always Time for True Crime. As always, I am your host, Julia. I've been doing this podcast for just over two months now, and I'm really thrilled that you guys have been listening and sharing reviews, suggesting cases, engaging with me on social media, just all that kind of stuff, so I wanted to thank you. So for episode 10, I thought I would give you the story of a triple homicide. This is the heartbreaking, brutal murder of Joan, Michelle, and Christy Rogers. Our story starts on June 4, 1989, in Tampa Bay, Florida, when the bodies of three women were found floating in the water. All three bodies were naked from the waist down, had had their arms and legs bound with rope, tape over their mouth, and were previously held down with cinder blocks. Even with these 30-pound blocks, gases had lifted the bodies and the blocks to the surface. Just to clarify, When a body is decomposing, bacteria from decomposition produces gases, and when these gases have nowhere to go because the body is underwater, it will start to swell up the body, which is why bodies found in water are usually bloated. After some time, as the body bloats more and more, these gases inside the body will begin to float up to the surface. The three unidentified bodies were sent to the coroner, where a medical examiner determined these women had only been in the water for three days. Because the water in the bay was quite warm, and the last few days had been hot Florida days, the rate of decomposition had been sped up, causing the bodies to rise to the surface much faster. While police waited for a cause of death to be determined, they focused on trying to ID the three victims. They were all women, one older, perhaps in her 30s or 40s, and two younger adolescents. This information was broadcasted on the news to see if anyone knew three women matching the description who'd recently gone missing. And it worked. A local hotel manager called the tip line saying he believed he might know the missing women. Three women, who he assumed was a mother with her two teen daughters, had checked into his motel a few days prior, but he hadn't seen them since. Police immediately went over to investigate the tip and upon entering the motel room of the women, realized nobody had been in this room for days. The beds didn't appear to have been slept in, no towels had been used, no coffee mugs or wine glasses had been used. I mean, it's entirely possible the people in this room were just very clean, but it was definitely suspicious. Upon further examination, police learned the room was registered to 36-year-old Joan Rogers and her two children. Michelle, age 17, and Christy, age 14. The three women were from Ohio and had come up to Florida for what neighbors said was their first ever vacation. The family lived on and operated a dairy farm and all worked very hard to do their part. Police notified Hal Rogers, Joan's husband and the girl's father, that the three may be missing and about the speculation of the bodies in the water. Hal told police that the girls had gone away on a little getaway, leaving on May 26, and that he had stayed home to take care of the farm. Investigators then learned that Hal had expected his family back days ago, and had actually just reported them missing. However, this caught their attention because Hal had actually waited three days after they were supposed to come home to report it. Hal said that he hadn't heard from them in a few days, because remember, this was 1989, and that he assumed they had gotten held up somewhere or decided to stay an extra night or two. But after three days, he grew more concerned. Then police had to give Mr. Rogers even more horrible news. The bodies were so decayed that they would need Joan, Michelle, and Christie's dental records to make identification. So the dental records were immediately sent to the coroner's office, and later confirmed the identities of the victims. It was, in fact, Joan and her two daughters. 
Michelle was a 17-year-old girl who was excited about starting her senior year of high school in the fall. Her little sister Christy was 14 and would be entering high school as a freshman at the same time. Unfortunately for the families, the autopsies didn't offer any more closure or good news. The coroner discovered water in the three victims' lungs, meaning they were alive when put into the water. To me, that is just so terrifying. I, of course, read a lot about true crime, but this case just gave me chills. Another letdown for investigators was that any kind of forensic evidence had been washed away by the water. It was also impossible to tell if the women were sexually assaulted, which many assume they had been because they were naked from the waist down. Many articles I read said they were sexually assaulted, but in forensic files, it said that many assumed this, though it was never actually proven. The funerals were held on June 13th, back in their small Ohio hometown. So many people attended that they could hardly fit everyone in the church. Hal Rogers sat in the front pew, quote, stone-faced and unreadable. He quickly became the prime suspect because he was the husband, and police always need to clear the significant others early on in the investigations. But the more police looked into Hal, the more the suspicion grew. Like I said, Hal took three days to report his family missing. Police also reported that he was very unemotional after hearing about the death of his family. And that comes across a bit strange to me, especially since they died in such a brutal way. But, to be fair, I've said it before and I'll say it again, everyone grieves differently. But then, police learn about Hal's brother. Hal's brother, John Rogers, was in jail on a sexual assault charge. In fact, Rogers had a previous charge against him for assaulting his niece, Michelle. However, these charges were dropped because of a plea argument John had made, so he was never actually proved guilty of that. Hal's mother was very supportive of John and even said Michelle had made up her story of assault and that her son John was actually innocent. This, as you could imagine, caused a huge rift in the family and Hal stopped speaking to most of his side of the family, which is totally understandable. But once this was announced to the media, many began to wonder, was this coincidence? Or could this all have been related? Was someone getting revenge? Or did tragedy and heartbreak just follow this family everywhere they went? Police didn't want to waste too much time on the brother John. After all, he was in prison at the time of the murders. So they had turned their attention on Hal. Though Hal had an alibi. Many residents of the small Ohio town where they lived confirmed that they had seen Hal out at a restaurant that day. And if Hal was in Ohio that day, how could he have gotten to Tampa Bay to commit the murders? So once police found out about the alibi, they cleared Hal as a suspect. But residents of the community were still suspicious. Joan's sister stuck by her brother-in-law, as she believed, like I said earlier, that there was no one way to respond to grief. And the media was very biased with Hal. The media never reported that Hal worked nonstop on his farm as a way to not have to think about what happened to his family. Nobody knew that Hal didn't cry at the funeral because he was still in shock. They didn't know that he had been riddled with guilt, crying to his sister-in-law that he should have been there with them. And lastly, they didn't know that Hal had even dealt with suicidal thoughts. And because of the media's portrayal, even after he was cleared, people still looked at Hal differently. But then, investigators got their first lead when they found Joan Rogers' car in the parking lot of a loading dock, just one mile from the motel she and her daughters were staying at. As detectives searched the car, they found two handwritten notes at the bottom of a map. Handwriting experts were able to confirm that at least one of the notes was not written by any of the three women. The note that detectives were focusing on was directions to the boat dock that the car was in. Beside the directions were the words, blue with white. What was interesting about that was that the blue with white part 
was in fact written by Joan. It seemed as though Joan had added on this small detail onto the directions somebody else had written her. This gave detectives the idea that they had come to the dock looking for a blue and white boat. Maybe they were meeting somebody. They had had a couple tips from people in the area saying that sometimes guys with boats would run an illegal boat or cruise service where they would take people out on the boat for money. Forensics teams were also able to find a partial palm print on the map, but since they didn't have any suspects, they put it away to be safely stored. By the time they had all of this information, months had passed since the murders, because as true crime lovers know, evidence in DNA isn't like the movies where it's processed in one hour. It can take a really long time. Then, in October 1989, a young woman, who we're just going to refer to as Judy, came forward with some information. She was Canadian, but had been visiting the Tampa Bay area in May of 1989 just weeks before the Rogers women had been murdered. She told investigators she had been offered an evening boat ride by a man at the same loading dock and that she had accepted. And I'm not victim blaming in any way, but my true crime brain is going, nope, 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 nope. Once out on the boat, the man held a knife to her throat and demanded sex. When the woman refused, he sexually assaulted her. The woman was able to remember details that were helpful to police, such as the fact that this man had had yellow rope on board his boat, the same color rope that had tied down Joan, Michelle, and Christy. As night fell, the man pulled the boat closer to the shore and told her to swim to the dock. And yes, Judy did report the crime after it had happened, but they were unable to do a rape test kit because she had showered before going to police. After hearing her story, police began to wonder if this man could have escalated into murdering three women, just weeks after this sexual assault. So thanks to Judy coming forward, the police were able to get a sketch from her, which they distributed all around the area. The suspect was in his mid-30s, white, about 5'10 and 180 pounds, with strawberry blonde hair. The victim also told police the suspect had told her his name was Dave and that he owned an aluminum company. The police immediately did check to see if there were any men named Dave who lived in the area and owned an aluminum company, but there were none. After releasing the composite, detectives interviewed more than 800 men who matched the description and or had a blue and white boat. But unfortunately, this turned up nothing. The case was even featured on the TV show Unsolved Mysteries twice. But the murder of Joan, Michelle, and Christy was turning cold. It had been one year since, and police had exhausted every lead they had, and nothing new was coming in. That's when they decided to send the case to the FBI. The FBI came back with a suspect profile that terrified police. The man they were searching for was one who enjoyed the suffering of others. He had left the three women's eyes uncovered so he could watch the fear in their eyes. FBI told the cops that this was probably not his first attack and that he would continue to kill until he was caught. Tampa Bay could be dealing with a serial killer and the police needed to stop him. The FBI told the police to tell the public everything they knew about this man. He was going to be hard to catch, as he probably appeared harmless, probably had a good job, maybe even a family. So police took a chance on the only piece of evidence they had, the handwritten note they had found in Joan's car. Hundreds of people had called in with tips about the sketch because they recognized the face. Maybe someone would recognize the handwriting. In 1992, almost three years after the murders, police put up five billboards around the Tampa Bay area with a photograph of the writing and the title, Who Wrote These Directions? with a $25,000 reward. Meanwhile, a Tampa Bay woman already had suspicions about her neighbor. Joanne Steffi had seen the sketch earlier and was struck by how much it looked like her neighbor. 
Her neighbor, like the sketch, had reddish blonde hair and the same height and weight as the suspect. Though Joanne knew that he was a bit older than what the description said. Her neighbor was Oba Chandler. She had always thought that he was a little creepy. The guy who kind of tries too hard to be friendly and then kind of comes off weird. However, when she showed the sketch to her friend, her friend said it didn't really look like Chandler. No more than it did tons of other reddish blonde haired men. She then told Joanne to be careful with the accusations. She could ruin an innocent man's life. And while I think you should always report your suspicions to police, I get why Joanne and her friend didn't want to accuse him just based off a sketch. I think if I were in that situation, I would probably think of any way to tell myself that it wasn't him. Like Joanne said, she thought Chandler was older than what the sketch said. So she was probably like, okay, well, I guess it can't be him because Chandler is in his 40s and the sketch said the suspect is in his 30s. It just couldn't be him. I mean, Oba Chandler was married. He had kids. He couldn't be the monster Tampa Bay was looking for. But when she saw the handwriting on the billboard, she was shocked. Joanne knew that handwriting. Not only was Chandler her neighbor, he had also done some contracting work for her, and she had a written contract from him. She went home to go get out the old form, and bam, the writing was the exact same as the writing on the billboard. The most notable thing about the writing is that the writer had capitalized the letter T every time it was used, even when it was in the middle of the word, which is super weird. Joanne immediately faxed it over to police. Of course, it took months for police to get to her tip and investigate it further because they had to comb through hundreds of leads. Joanne says that while she was waiting for police to follow up with her, she was terrified Chandler would find out she was onto him and kill her too. Honestly, I'd be scared too, knowing your neighbor is capable of something like that. But police finally got to investigating her lead and was able to match the two handwriting samples. They then began to look into Oba Chandler and were shocked at how well he fit their profile. Oba Chandler had grown up in Ohio with four siblings. As a juvenile, he had charges for many petty crimes like stealing cars, burglary, kidnapping, and armed robbery. He had been married seven times and fathered 13 children with 12 different women. He was currently 46 years old and living with his wife and youngest daughter. But there was one problem. When police searched his current address, he didn't live close to the dock at all like the FBI had assumed. In fact, he lived across the state. Even so, police didn't give up on Chandler, and thank goodness, because they would later learn that Chandler had recently moved. And what was his previous address? Dalton Avenue, right around the corner from the boat dock. As if this wasn't enough to make him suspicious, records also showed he used to own a blue and white boat, but had sold it three months after the murders. Then the final nail in the coffin. Chandler was an aluminum contractor. Remember, he had told his first victim that he owned an aluminum company. Oba Chandler fit their suspect to a T. With this evidence, police got his fingerprints from the prison he was at as an adolescent. Because it was only 1992, there was no database system to store all the fingerprints, so you would actually have to have a suspect in mind to compare to these fingerprints. On September 24th, 1992, police finally arrested Oba Chandler for the rape of Judy back in 1989. While he sat in jail for the rape, they could find out how to convict him for a murder. It looked as though as they had found their killer, and lab results were able to confirm that it was indeed Chandler's palm print on the map in Jones' car. However, proving Chandler had murdered the three women wouldn't be as easy as it seemed. Once Chandler lawyered up, he said that yes, he had met the women and given them directions to the dock, which was why his fingerprints were on the map, and why the handwriting matched, but he denied killing them. 
And while that was obviously bullshit, the prosecution would have to prove him the murderer beyond a reasonable doubt. After police were able to charge him with murder, Chandler's son-in-law came forward to tell police that Chandler had confessed to raping and throwing the three women overboard. Now, they had a witness to testify for them. This was definitely huge, but then again, witnesses can easily be discredited on the stand. Investigators just needed one more piece of incriminating evidence, something that proved he was at the scene of the murders when they took place. That's when they dug up ship-to-shore phone call records. How these calls work is that the person on the boat calls an operator, and then the operator patches them through to the house they want to call on land. Remember, this is the time before cell phones. Police were able to find records that calls from Chandler's boat had called his home that night. The person on the boat also told the operator their name was Oba. So that was pretty damning. This proved he was on the boat, out on the water, at the time of the murders. Records also confirmed his boat was out on the water at the time of his first attack on Judy. With this placing Chandler at the scene, a prosecution team felt confident enough to go to trial. His trial began in 1994, and his first victim, Judy, who had been assaulted by Chandler in May of 1989, was there to bravely testify against him. The prosecution told jurors how Chandler had lured the three women onto his boat with the promise of a sunset boat ride around the bay. He seemed friendly and charming. He too had grown up in Ohio, just 100 miles from where the Rogers lived. He probably used this to make the women feel more comfortable. Chandler maintained his innocence and even took the stand in his own defense, which kind of gives me Ted Bundy vibes. I just think taking the stand in your own defense is just so risky and if a defendant wants to do it, it kind of shows arrogance and that they think that they would do a better job proving themselves innocent than their lawyers would. So Chandler's story was that he was on the water, but then his boat had broken down that night because of a gas leak and that he had later fixed the gas leak that night by duct taping the tank. However, According to one of the prosecution's witnesses, who was a boat mechanic, the diesel fuel in the tank would have dissolved the tape anyway. So this kind of flattened his story. It took the jury only 90 minutes to decide Oba Chandler's fate, and on November 4th, 1994, he was charged with three counts of kidnapping and first-degree murder. Chandler, 48 at the time, said nothing and showed no emotion. The next day, the jury was back in court to decide if Chandler should get the death penalty for the murders. The jurors deliberated for 30 minutes before deciding, yes, Oba Chandler should be executed for his crimes. To the jurors, Chandler was proof that evil existed. Many are still haunted to this day by the pictures of the bodies of the three women. Oba Chandler appealed his conviction, but every time it was upheld, and he was assigned an execution date in October 2011. Chandler said in an interview that his last words would be, Kiss my rosy red ass. But when Chandler was asked on November 15, 2011, if he had any final last words, all he could do was shake his head no. He died by lethal injection at the age of 65 on November 15, 2011, just before 4.30 p.m., with Hal Rogers behind the glass to see him take his last breath. His last meal was two salami sandwiches on white bread with mustard, a peanut butter and jelly sandwich on white bread, and a coffee, which honestly kind of sounds like a pretty shitty last meal. None of Chandler's family came to say goodbye. In fact, he hadn't had a visitor to the jail in 17 years. An hour after his death, Officials found a note in his cell that read, quote, You are killing an innocent man. But Oba Chandler was anything but innocent. And also, to write a note instead of just saying that as your final last words, he is such a disgusting coward. 
Three years after his death, in 2014, Olba Chandler was linked to another murder through DNA that had been unsolved for 23 years. Detectives were able to confirm that 20-year-old Ivalice Berrios Begoris had been murdered by Chandler in November of 1990 while on her way home from work. He is also still suspected in many other murders and disappearances of many other women, and many women have come forward as sexual assault victims of Chandler's. As for Hal, he has since remarried and become a stepfather of four. His second wife was a widow as well, so they both knew what it was like to lose your spouse. They now have grandchildren to love and spoil. He no longer runs a dairy farm, and according to an article written in 2011, owned a pig farm and is turning 66 this year. Oba Chandler was a monster, and it's very likely he will never be held accountable, even in death, for other people that he killed. I thought that this case was really different because, as a true crime fan, you always suspect the husband. And police did too. And then we're all kind of thrown for a loop when we find out it was actually a random killing by a serial killer. So, sometimes it's not the husband. Usually is, though. <laughs> so, thanks for listening to episode 10. I hope this was a new case for you guys. And you know the drill. Leave me a 5-star review if you'd like. And if you'd like to follow me on social media, I am on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Always Time for True Crime. Thanks again to everyone who has listened to the past 10 episodes, and I'll see you guys next week for episode 11.